Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, Bringing New Forms of Data to the Study of Cities. I'm Margarita Seraulo, an Outreach Officer working for the UK Data Service, and presenting today is Danny Arribas Bell, a lecturer in Geographic Data Science at the Consumer Data Research Centre and based at the University of Liverpool. Welcome everyone, thank you very, very much for tuning in today. My name is Daniel rivas Bell, and I work at the University of Liverpool in the Department of Geography and Planning, and I'm also a member of something called the Geographic Data Science Lab, which is a research unit here in geography. So to, today, basically, I want to give you an overview of some of the main changes that I think have happened in the last few years around the area of data and cities, and the intersection really of those two. So for that, uh, I'll, the talk is split really much, pretty much in two parts. The first half I'm going to talk very broadly about kind of big picture changes that have swept this data landscape for cities and urban research. And then in the second one, I'll switch gears and um, show you hopefully a couple of examples of my own research. And this is not really because I consider them to be the best examples ever, but they are projects that I was involved in. So in case there were any questions afterwards, I feel much more comfortable speaking for, for my own projects than, than other people. So before that, let me tell you a little bit about what I call the geodata revolution or the data revolution. And the best way I could find to put that succinctly and clearly was in a sentence that kind of builds in itself. And it's this idea that over the last decade, uh, there's been an explosion of data available to researchers, and that's probably hard to, to counter-argue. Um, a lot of this data comes in new forms, which what I really mean by that is that it's not necessarily more of the same kinds of data that we used to have for studying cities. So we don't have a census every year instead of every 10, or we don't have more surveys. What we have is a lot of data that look and feel very, very different from what we're used to. A lot of those data sets either relate to cities or to activities that happen within cities, so they are um, of high interest for people interested in uh, processes that explain how cities work and the, the mechanisms that underpin those processes. Um, and then another thing that's very important for people like me is that I, a lot of these data sets come georeferenced which, in other words, essentially means that one way or another, either through address or lat long coordinates or the um, a unique identifier for the polygon or the, the geographic unit or the data point uh, refers to, um, we can essentially put them on a map. And, is, and that's very good news for people uh, who are interested in spatial dimensions of cities. And then the final caveat to this statement is that um, a lot of these data sets have come in what I call in a paper I wrote a couple of years ago in an accidental way. And with this, what I mean is that these data sets were never really uh, designed for research and they were never really um, thought to be either representative of the whole population or to capture exactly the kinds of things you think they capture um, and so on. And this last bit, uh, actually is related to a lot of the challenges that I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Um, but before that, let me give you a sense of which kinds of data I'm really talking about. So this comes at three levels, at the individual uh, level, at the business level, and then at the government level. Um, let me back up. At the individual level, uh, what we have is data collected from mobile sensors. You can think of smartphones. Uh, you can think of... Um, tablets, smartwatches, similar gadgets that have a GPS enabled that are connected to the internet and that can then essentially start pumping data um, as the user goes, goes by, even in a passive way. At the business level, what I really mean is that a lot of the companies and firms that used to do activities that are completely offline, that had no digital counterpart, have either taken parts of those activities and made them digital. So for instance, you can think how um, shops have gone from keeping their books on books to keeping their books on spreadsheets, and that's creating essentially a data set. 
And if the shop is large enough, that's not a spread suit, it's a database that is sitting in some server, and so on. Or some businesses have entirely uh, built their, their business model and their way of making money, essentially, around this idea of generating data and monetizing them. And for that, you can think from Google, which we all know, to some other examples that are much closer to, to this field, such as um, Walkscore, which essentially compiles an index of accessibility in cities and walkability, or Strava, which provides a service for people to record their uh, the rides or runs, commutes, and so on, um, and so on. And then the final one is the government sector, which in the last 15 to 20 years has been on, a, um, on an increased effort to, and it's not clear how long this, that's going to continue, but at least what's, what's sure is that in the last few decades, um, governments have been releasing a lot of the data that they were using for internal purposes, such as processing taxes, uh, budgeting, etc. they've been releasing it uh, as open data. And that's essentially opened the door for a lot of analysis in terms of um, transparency and in terms of accountability, but also has created uh, as a side product, uh, again, accidentally in many ways, has given a lot of researchers who are interested in cities the opportunity to look into aspects um, that just weren't available. In the UK, the clearest example for that I can think of is the land registry, which used to obviously keep track of um, how much houses are sold for, and that was for tax purposes. Uh, now everyone can go to their land, regist land registry website and check every single trans transaction that has happened in England. Um, so that's a good example. So what does this mean um, in terms of the opportunities and challenges that it creates for researchers interested in, in cities? Let's start with the bright side and the good news. Um, and this is that, essentially, if you're like me, this is like walking into a candy store because a lot of these data sets are much, much more granular over both space and time. So instead of having a census every year, now you have almost real-time data feeds that are giving you information about some activities that take place in cities. Um, in some cases, they provide a, actually a better measurement for certain phenomena. So in some, uh, for some phenomena that were interested in cities, um, we've been forced to rely on proxies, and a lot of those proxies these days um, we don't need them really anymore because we can actually access the actual process. And all of this high granularity and better measurement and essentially constant collection of data instead of in intervals has created what uh, you can think of almost or I think of almost as an always-on observatory that essentially is keeping a, an updated record of where the city is at. And this is really interesting in general if you're if you want to know more about cities, but it's particularly interesting, I think, in the case of um, evaluation of in intervention. So if you think of what happens to a city when a new train station gets put or a new railway line uh, gets added to the subway system, um, with a lot of these always on collection data collection exercises, you essentially all you have to do is let the intervention happen and then look at what the city looked like before, what it looks after the intervention, and then it is much easier um, to create um, evaluations or assessments about what the real effects of certain policies were. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is that because these, a lot of these data sets are coming new forms, as I said before, um, there's a set of challenges that we, in most cases, didn't really have to think about in the old days, so to speak. So the three, there's a, a ton of them, and, and some of them are really important, but I'm not going to necessarily mention in this context, and you can think of privacy, um, ethics, and so on. From the pure point of view of the researcher who's interested in cities and tapping into some of these new sources of data, I see three main ones. The first one is the quality of the data in terms of bias, coverage, etc. Um, by this, what I mean is that essentially, because these data sets were accidental in the sense that they were never really intended for research, a lot of the quality check and um, gatekeeping that 
statistical agencies have been doing for a long time. So if you think of all the efforts the census puts into um, putting out a representative and accurate uh, data set, all of those things essentially kind of go out of the out the window because you know if you're interested, if you look at Twitter data, for example, there's no um, you know, there's nobody at Twitter making sure that the georeference tweets are representative of everyone who is in a given city, for instance. So a lot of that is, is just the fact that it's a, a feature of these data sets and in, in some contexts there is not very relevant and in some others it can be very, very relevant. So it's something that social scientists need to wake up to this realization that you know just because it's data is not necessarily going to be good data, which is what we were used to in the old days. So that's one, the, the quality concern. The second challenge is, is technical in the sense that a lot of these data come delivered in forms that we're not used to in, in urban research. So again, to make the analogy with the census, you can go to the website of the ONS or whichever provider the, each country has, the Census Bureau in the US and so on, and you know click your way through a more or less intuitive website that is designed for you to find data, although sometimes it's hard to believe that, and at the end of the day, click and download a nicely crafted file that gives you the information you want um, and that you were looking for. In the case of a lot of these new forms of data, this is not the case, again, because it was never intended, it was never designed for um, research, so researchers have to kind of adapt themselves to whichever way this information is delivered, and the way this is, is technically very different. So. Uh, you can think of application programming interfaces, APIs, as, which, as the way that many um, many companies make some of the data available, or uh, much more archaic and, and old school ways. For instance, a lot of the data that governments put out in many cases um, comes in the form of tables in PDFs. And, um, that's just the way it comes, and it's not ideal, but in, in many cases that's the only way you have. So this basically means that researchers interested in accessing this data have to upskill themselves in terms of um, computational literacy and um, programming skills, essentially. And the final one, the final challenge that I have is, is a more conceptual one, is what I call methodological challenges, and it's somehow related to the previous one, although the previous one mostly focuses on tools, and to put it in a, in a simpler way, in the old days you had to know how to use spreadsheets and maybe some statistical software. Um, in the new, in this kind of new world, you basically need to know a little bit of programming to access the, the data. Methodologically speaking, I think there's also a bit of a shift in this, in that some of the methods that urban researchers have accessed or have used and relied on for decades are not necessarily the best fit for this kind of data. And this comes because, again, they were never designed for this, for the shape and, and structure of this data set. So you can think how much research has gone on in the um, econometrics or statistical literature to develop methods that fit this idea of small data sets where you have to impose a lot of assumptions because otherwise it's very hard to get to any conclusions. In this new world, that's not necessarily the same uh, case and, and the challenges are are different. You can think of, for instance, instead of how to deal with the lack of data, how do you deal with too much data that gives you significant significant results in any context? What do you do to uh, find out what effects you're really looking forward and, and so on? And a lot of this, I think, what is going to translate into in the next coming years, and to some extent it's happening already in many contexts, is um, that we're going to have to go out and borrow from other fields and maybe even develop new methods. Um, so it's, it's, I don't think in five to ten years it will be very strange for, a, for an empirical researcher who wants to look at uh, cities through the lens of data to have to take courses in machine learning or, um, or computer science departments, and I think um, that's starting to happen. So those are the opportunities and challenges these, these data um, are bringing with them. Now, raw data per se, just the data records are not necessarily useful. And you know, we, this is not a new um, fact. This is something we've known for a long time in, in urban research. What we're really interested in is the insights that those data can 
um, can provide us. And that translation comes through the layer of the analytics and the statistical analysis. So a lot of these new data sets have in themselves created um, new spins of statistics and data analysis in what's been called this field of data science, which combines a lot of the tools and methods for looking at modern data sets in, with modern infrastructure and so on. Now, because a lot of these urban new forms of data are georeferenced, what we are trying to push, and I think that's, um, I'm not alone in, in this call, is that this by itself cannot be, um, is not enough, essentially. Um, and if we have decades of research in, in GIS and geographic information systems, we should not forget that because particularly if you look at it, the data science curriculum, essentially it completely ignores space and geography. So that there's no, it's as if data were existing in some vacuum um, and not in, in geographical space. So what we're proposing is um, combining these two, what we call, for a lack of a better term, geographic data science. And by that, what we mean is the combination of data science approaches and tools to deal with modern data sets, um, and combining that with the expertise developed by the GI science literature, the geographic information literature, um, to bring in the power of location and geospatial data, which in some context is, is particular and, and makes it different data. So that was essentially uh, my conceptual part of the talk. Now I'm going to switch gears and show you a couple of examples that I've worked on in the last few years that I think to some extent encapsulate most of the ideas I've just uh, talked about um, reasonably well. So the first one, sorry, I don't know what, yeah. The first one is this um, is something that eventually made it into a feature graphic in regional science, regional studies that I ended up calling the spoken postcodes and it's about neighborhoods and it's about redefining neighborhood boundaries. So neighborhoods are areas in, within cities that share the same character. Actually, if you go back to the Oxford Dictionary, that's the, the key, um, that's the, what the definition alludes to and it's this idea of character that essentially makes a part of a city a neighborhood in itself, is sharing the same character. And then at the same time, the idea of neighborhoods or small areas within cities um, is a key concept in a lot of public funding and a lot of social science in the sense that many studies and many um, public policy decisions are made on this idea of, um, or rely one way, or, one way or another on the idea of the neighborhood as a meaningful unit of analysis. And that's why some policies target certain neighborhoods and a lot of the urban literature in social science also uses neighborhoods for, um, for their analysis. Now, however, a lot of the available boundaries or av available um, forms of neighborhood essentially rely on administrative boundaries. And in some cases, that's fine and there's no problem with that. In some other cases, the processes that the researcher is interested in um, are probably different enough so that administrative boundaries are not good proxies to measure what the neighborhood is. So in this, what I did in this piece of work was trying to redraw neighborhood boundaries so they better represent this idea of character. Um, and this was just an example, so um, I wanted to also use a new source of data to show how well, to do something that essentially couldn't have done 10 years ago because we didn't have this, this, uh, this data. Um, and again, same as I said a couple of slides ago, um, kind of put everything together through this idea of, of geographic data science methods. So to do that, what I did was I took a bunch of georeference tweets in the city of Amsterdam, which is the, the map that you're currently seeing on the screen. And each tweet had a, well, had a message, and then I extracted the language that that message was uh, written in, and I essentially classified every small area in Amsterdam into, um, I aggregated the tweets by language by area, essentially, and it's based on the proportions of different languages that every small area has, 
that I aggregate areas into more consistent neighborhoods. So to give you a reference, what you're seeing right now is the current postcode map of Amsterdam. So what you see is a very neat struct neatly structured um, setup where every area, every postcode is almost as large as every other one, and that's by design because um, they need to have the same the same size, the same or at least similar shape. They're very equally structured around the city. It's almost, you know, as much as the geography of Amsterdam allows, which is actually not very much, they're very orderly and very, uh, they're structured almost like a grid. Now, if instead of these, what you do is redraw these uh, boundaries using um, language information from tweets, and then you aggregate that through a, um, a space of machine learning algorithm, as it did in this, what you end up is with a map that looks more like this one, which it's a map that has the same number of neighborhoods as the previous one, um, but these are drawn based on similarity of the mix-up of languages. So essentially, if you're familiar with, with Amsterdam, the city center uh, comes in what in the yellow and big, the small yellow and big blue blurb in the center, and what those areas are telling us from the analysis is that the mix of languages that you get is very similar within the area and is different from the other areas, um, to kind of put it in short. And if you look at this map, let me flick back again to the original one and then back again. What you get is a very, very different geography of neighborhoods in, in Amsterdam. And, and the one that is come out of the, the language data is essentially much more me much messier, is much more irregular. There are some polygons that are very, very large. Like if you look at the bottom right, all of that is, is one neighborhood. In the postcodes, that was four or five. Um, and there's also very small pockets of um, outlier areas that have um, that are a neighborhood in themselves, and, are, and which are much smaller than, than the postcodes that um, we had in the previous map. And in, in a way, if you think about it, that's essentially what cities are. They are messy mixes of people, activities, organizations, firms, and everyone goes about with their own interest, and the result is equally messy, and it's not surprising. And actually, if you know a little bit of, of Amsterdam, um, I'm not going to do a very scientific validation of these, but a lot of what you think of the city when you look at a map, it's captured pretty well in terms of uh, the boundaries that the, this algorithm um, produced. So that's one example. The second one is what I call the space time Lisa calendar, and this is also in another paper that's still under revision. Um, the idea in this context was slightly different. It was it was, a, it was more of a methodological challenge to design new visualization approaches that allowed us to uh, make sense and exploit as much as possible uh, large granular data sets um, about urban activity like the ones I've been talking about um, throughout this, this session. So in particular, what we wanted was to identify hotspots of activity in a data set worth of three years of mobile phone activity in Amsterdam. So essentially what we had was aggregated usage for different for every antenna and for the city of Amsterdam. And we had hourly measurements for over uh, three years, although there's uh, some missing data. So what that means is that we have about 300 antennas, which each of them has a catchment area, so you can think of them as a polygon in which the whole city of Amsterdam is split up into um, exhaustive areas. And for each of those 200 something areas, we had, our, we had a, a, vol, a measurement of activity for every hour for three years. So if you do the math, that's essentially a lot of um, data points. Now, if you completely disregard the um, time dimension of this data set and you only look at the spatial one, which is not completely unlike you, what you would have been able to do with, say, census data every 10 years, what you get is something like this. This is the purely atemporal geography of Amsterdam, where you have um, a clear cluster in the city center that uh, 
captures most of the um, most of the canals where a lot of the tourist activity and, and non-tourist also daily life activity goes on and that's represented in the map with a red um, because it's a cluster of high activity and then the north of the city north of the lake I what you have is a cluster of low activity because you have it's mostly residential low density uh, parts of the city and that's also picked up by the algorithm. Now the map you're seeing on the screen at this point, it's essentially what you could have done with the census. It's not, the census doesn't provide uh, cell phone activity, but if you looked at population density or employment density, it's not very different. Now, because we actually have very fine-grained temporal information, um, we could decompress this uh, purely spatial map and turn it into, say, one day of activity, and that's what you see here. So what we've done here is for every hour of the day, we've reproduced the map that you see on, on the left-hand side. And what you see is that, sure enough, during the night there's not a whole lot of activity everywhere in the city, and as the day picks up around 9 or 10 a.m., um, activity starts picking up, the cluster starts defining, and then it grows, and as the day points down, it shrinks and splits into a couple of uh, sub-centers and then it dies off around uh, midnight. Now this is great and this is already something that you couldn't have done necessarily with sensors because the temporal resolution is very small. But if you remember what I just said a, a slide ago, I have three years worth of data like this, so essentially almost a thousand days like this, 24 maps per day per three years of days is a lot of maps and it's very, very difficult to make sense of what changes are, what happens with over time, are there any main patterns that are changing, are there areas that are popping up as clusters, um, areas that are winding down, and it's very, it becomes very difficult to visually assess this. So what we, if you represented that as, as you're seeing now, so what we did in this project was to come up with a different way of approaching the data and to visualize in it in what we call the, the calendar, or the space-time Lisa calendar. And that essentially looks like what you have on the screen at the minute. Uh, what this is, is essentially a color map that assigns red if the, well, it's one calendar for area. So you have as many calendars as areas, but for each area you can look at the, um, the results of the cluster analysis and you can see whether the area was considered a hotspot or it was a part of a cluster of high activity, low activity, and so on. Um, so the calendar structures information in the following way. Along the horizontal axis, what you have is every single day in the data set. And already you can see how this is a good tool also to spot uh, missing data. So every essentially every uh, white stripe is um, indicates we, we don't have data for those days. And that's the entire data set from December 2007 to November 2010. And what it does along the vertical axis is um, represent the hours of the day. So starting at midnight with zero and all the way into uh, 11 p.m. And then you can't see it because they're very fine, but essentially what you have is a grid there where the horizontal axis represents the day of that uh, observation and the vertical the hour. And then we color that depending on whether the, the area was part of a uh, cluster of high activity in red, cluster of low activity in blue, or uh, what we call spatial outlier, so an area with low activity close to a, a cluster of a high activity and the other way around. So that's the way you read this calendar. This is the one for uh, light supply, which is the epicenter of tourism tourist activity, essentially. If you've visited Amsterdam, there's a good chance you've been there. And what you see, essentially, is a profile of the city that, well, a profile of the area that you would expect and also that remains constant. So it's basically this graph is telling us that around 9, 9 a.m., the area becomes a cluster of high activity, and that stays constant pretty much all day long until around 10, 11 p.m., which is consistent with the rhythm of the area. And What's also important, throughout the three years that we have, um, that profile stays constant. Now another example, you can see it on the screen now, that's the, the area of Zaud, where uh, the World Trade Center in Amsterdam is located, 
And what you see is a slightly different profile because it looks much more jagged and it's almost, it's not constant. It, it picks up as an activity center at 10 a.m. It stops at around 5, 6 p.m. Um, and then every so often there seems to be um, a line or a day where there is not uh, a lot of activity. This is because essentially there's no residential or um, amenities here. All there is is banks where people go to work around 9, 10 and go home around 5 p.m. and that's what it shows. And also it's an area where in the weekends there's not a whole lot going on. So that's why every, every so often you have a part that is not color red and that gives you that this kind of profile of the, of the area. Now, this too, you could say, well, this is interesting. It's a neat way of looking at the data set, but essentially I could have told you that already because I know that Lights and Plane is the, the place where um, all the activities had, and I know that Zaud is a place where people go and need work, and then they go home. Now, where, where, the, where the usefulness of the calendar becomes much more obvious is in the next couple of examples where things start to happen as the data are being collected. So what you see in this case is an area in the west of the city, not too far from the back of the Fondel Park, the main um, green space in the city. And what you see is, again, think of this idea that I mentioned before of the always-on observatory, always collecting data, whatever it happens, and then you can go back and see what actually happened. So what we see here is that in the course of these um, two or three years, this area started as being part of no cluster. It, there wasn't a lot of activity. There was, it wasn't also a cluster with low activity. It was just an area where you could think of as an average area in terms of um, mobile phone usage. Now, something happened around you know, June 2009 that activity started picking up throughout the day. And you know, when I was doing this paper, I didn't know of this area. I was just flicking through every area. Um, and then I was surprised because it's a very particular profile. Then sure enough, I went back and looked up, looked up the area and there was a renovation of the square, of the main square in the center of this polygon um, that essentially brought in a shopping mall um, and a lot of office space and so on around 2010, 2009, 2010. So essentially what you can see is the change of this area and the, morph, the morphing of the area from an average area into a cluster of activity. And you know, if you were a, uh, an urban planner who had spent a lot of interest in, in this renovation, you might be interested in seeing whether it actually has had any effect, if it's, had a, if it's attracted more people, if it hasn't. And if you were to be looking at these calendars, if you thought about collecting this data daily, as you could because it's mobile phone data, if the company was happy with that, you could imagine how you could build this calendar live as it happens every day and start seeing these changes in the area or start visualizing the city as it's being made essentially or, or almost in real time. The final example I'm going to run through very quickly, it's another spin on the, on the previous story. It's an area also in the west of the, um, of the city and what you have here is not, um, it wasn't actually a uh, an average area, it was an area with not a lot of activity, but it was close to a cluster, and that's exemplified by this light blue. I didn't explain it before because of time constraints, but essentially light blue is a space a lot lighter that captures an area that is close, that it doesn't have a lot of activity, but is close to a lot of activity. And what you see throughout the course of the, uh, the period of this data set is that somewhere towards 2009, it starts flicking from light blue to red, and by the end of the data set is pretty much always red instead of blue. What that means is that this area has gone through the transition of being close to a cluster into being part of the cluster, and essentially that's what a spatial spillover looks like um, if you put it on a, on a calendar. So, um, that's pretty much what I had in mind for the uh, to show you today. Um, just a couple of uh, takeaway messages that I would like you to remember, hopefully, for this uh, session. And then, if there's any question, I'm happy to, to elaborate or, or on anything that I've talked about today. But essentially, I would be happy if you walked away from this webinar thinking or realizing that the, the world of data and the 
data landscape has tremendously expanded, well, and it's still expanding very, very rapidly, and that a lot of these data that are being added are not necessarily the same animals that we're used to in, in urban research. They are better in some in some respects, and they're not that great in some others, and it's, it's a balancing act of being aware of the limitations and being able to exploit the, the, the benefits that um, that it's at stake here, and that's why essentially I think it's a huge opportunity for for people like me or hopefully like you interested in in understanding cities or things activities that happen within cities, um, and then the final one is the the traditional methods we've been taught probably to look at uh, data on cities are not necessarily, in some cases they might, but uh, they're not always necessarily the best way to approach the uh, new forms of data because they, again, they're different animals and they have different characteristics. So there might be um, better tools out there to, to go and learn or to, to develop. So on that, uh, in case you want to download the PDF, this talk is mostly based on the following references, um, which is papers that I've written over the, past, over, over the last five years. Some of them are published, some of them are in the process of, of being, or trying to, be, trying to be published. Thank you for presenting today, Danny, and thank you everyone for joining the webinar. Bye. Bye.